please don't hesitate to let me know if you want to find a way to more about this. But Professor Token is an associate professor and chair in the Department of Philosophy and Religion at Ithaca College, of course, in Ithaca, New York. Uh, he is the author, co-author, Heber, Heber, Heber McCann, a uh, book called Libertarianism, For and Against. This was Roman Middle Field, 2005. He's also published journals and other or articles in other journals, such as the Philosophical Review, Philosophical Studies, and the Philosophy Compass. Please join me in welcoming Professor Duncan. All right, thank you very much for that welcome, Chris. I'm really I'm excited to be here at the Applied Ethics Institute. I work in philosophy, of course. Philosophy has a reputation for being somewhat esoteric, abstruse in the clouds, whereas I think it could be applied. Um, and so I'm going to try to show you how to bring philosophy down to earth today um, and I hope illuminate some real world concerns that uh, are pressing concerns for our country. Um, my talk, let me get this going. My talk is going to be about uh, human dignity and what it means for a society to take human dignity seriously. In particular, I'm going to be arguing that respect for dignity requires not just liberty rights, uh, but also equal opportunity rights. Um, I'll be explaining somewhat shortly the title No Eternal Exiles. Uh, that's kind of enigmatic, I hope so. I hope uh, um, uh, you'll be curious what that means. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about that as we go on. Um, so the first point I want to make is that human dignity is real. Uh, and for those who doubt this, I want to give you a couple of examples uh, that to me show the reality of human dignity. Um, and the first example took place on June 5th, 1989. I remember it because I was in college. Um, raise your hand if you weren't alive in 1989. Wow. That makes me feel really old. Um, but I was your age. I was uh, a sophomore in college when this was going on. Um, and it was very inspiring to me. This was a demonstration for democracy, for liberty, in China, in Tiananmen Square, which is the central square in Beijing, the capital of China. Um, and the students there had massive protests. Um, they erected a paper mache version of the Statue of Liberty. Uh, which is very inspiring. Interestingly, they didn't call it the Statue of Liberty, they called it the Goddess of Democracy. Uh, but unfortunately, there was a crackdown. Uh, the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, sent in tanks. Um, and uh, one image uh, became iconic as a result of those demonstrations. Uh, and this was a protester who was brave enough to stand in front of tanks. Um, let me actually show you. I've got a YouTube snippet here. Let's see if this works. I don't want to show you the whole thing. So. They've said it's a nice show band, I think. It's an interesting choice. There's the protester. And pretty soon the tank will turn around as if to go around him. stiffening as if he's prepared to sacrifice his life to be won over. It doesn't happen. The tank stops. I won't play the rest of it, but he climbs up and he tries to have a chat with the, the tank driver. Um, eventually some fellow protesters, we assume, uh, who are concerned, rush into the, uh, the camera's view and whisk him away. Uh, maybe they were protesters, maybe not, because we never hear of this guy again. No one knows what happened to him. No one even knows his name. Um, all he's known by, quite literally, is Tank Man. Um, so if you want to learn more, just Google Tank Man. You can learn what little we know. Don't Google Tank Girl, you'll get something else entirely. Okay? <laughs> tank Man. 
So that's example number one. And what I'm suggesting to you is that's dignity on display. Someone standing up for his or her beliefs, his in this case, um, standing up for the values of liberty, democracy, equality. Um, and I'm going to try and draw a connection between dignity and those values. Let me get back. Um, the next example I want to give uh, is Rosa Parks. Um, famously, with quiet but steadfast dignity, she refused to give up her seat and moved to the back of the bus, as the Jim Crow laws in Alabama in 1955 required. Commenting later on her act, and of course her act helped to galvanize the civil rights movement is the very start of it. Um, commenting later on her act, Martin Luther King Jr. wrote, no one can understand the action of Mrs. Parks unless he realizes that eventually the cup of endurance runs over and the human personality cries out, I can take it no longer. I'm going to be saying more about that reference to human personality in a minute. Um, and I suggest, again, like Tank Man, uh, this is an example of dignity on display, dignity in action, standing up uh, for your worth as a person, a very courageous and brave act. Um, and these brave acts of uh, standing up for dignity, I suggest, make human dignity visible to all of us. But we need to do more than just dignity. As a philosopher, I want to understand both what dignity is and what it means to respect human dignity. And here I would like to call attention to Martin Luther King Jr.'s reference to uh, human personality. Okay, for I'm going to argue it's in the distinctive features of the human personality that human dignity surely resides. I'm going to get some more help from Martin Luther King Jr. Um, famously, uh, uh, he wrote a letter while in uh, prison, in jail, in Birmingham City. He was in jail for some illegal uh, protests. Um, and he came under fire from uh, fellow ministers, white ministers of Birmingham, who said, look, we support your cause, but we don't like your methods because your methods are illegal, marching in protests where you're not allowed. And he took that occasion to write a letter justifying his methods, justifying civil disobedience. Um, and he argued that laws lose their authority when they're unjust. And that obligated him to provide some criterion by which to distinguish just from unjust laws. And this is what he said in a famous quotation. Any law that uplifts human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. And I think the language of uplifting and degrading is language that fits very naturally with the language of human dignity. And I suggest that something like dignity was certainly in Martin Luther King Jr.'s mind as he wrote these words. Um, and I'm suggesting that he's right to locate dignity in the human personality and regard disrespect for dignity as a form of degradation of human personality. That's what I'm going to be arguing. So now I need to turn and say, well, what is it about human personality that gives us a special dignity? Um, and I'm going to propose that human dignity resides in our distinctive human mental capacities. In particular, our mental capacities for deliberate choice or responsible choice, as I'll say. And when I say our distinctive capacity for choice, I have in mind such capacities as our self-consciousness, self-awareness, our capacity to imagine the future consequences of our actions, our capacity to articulate our values, to deliberate between choices, deciding which of the many options open to us we want to pursue, uh, and to guide our choice by those actions, uh, by those, choice, uh, by those uh, decisions. Because of these capacities, Humans can choose their actions and make their choices their own in a very deep way. We're not just creatures who are pushed and pulled around by instinct and impulse. Now, that's a big philosophical issue there, free will. I'm not going to solve free will tonight. But what I want to do is suggest that there's a difference between adult human choices and the choices of very young humans. That as you get older, your choices get more sophisticated, and we start to hold you responsible for your choices in a way that we don't hold three, four, five, six-year-old children responsible. Um, 
and that suggests that uh, adult human choices are of a distinctive kind, a kind that deserves respect. Um, and so my uh, thesis is, is that um, our capacity for deep and deliberate choice is what gives human beings their special dignity. All right, um, so there's my formula. I'm not alone in this, I didn't originate this, I can't claim any originality for this. Uh, you can find ancient traditions that go back at least as far as the Stoics, the Greek and Roman Stoics. I could put a picture up there, uh, up there of Seneca, who's a famous um, uh, Roman Stoic, uh, uh, tutor to Emperor Nero, who was a very bad student, apparently. He didn't listen to his uh, elder Seneca. And also famously, more recently, Immanuel Kant, um, who was the central figure of the German Enlightenment. I don't think either philosopher is particularly well served by those pictures. When I showed my students at the college uh, this picture uh, of Kant in particular, they broke into an impromptu debate about whether he most resembled Dobby or Yoda. <laughs> and I think Dobby won in the end. Um, uh, so there's probably better pictures of Kant I could have chosen. Uh, the point is, though, is that um, while not exactly agreeing with me in every point, and I don't exactly agree with them in every point, um, this idea of locating a special dignity uh, in human choice and drawing from that uh, the importance of freedom and equality, which I'll be doing soon, um, there's precursors to this. I certainly uh, am not um, you know, innovating this idea. What I hope to do is to um, package it in a slightly different way and also display its relevance for contemporary issues. Okay, um, what I'm going to do is offer like a framework, a vocabulary for understanding uh, dignity. Okay, we have to ask, um, supposing uh, I'm right that it's our deliberate choice capacities that give us a special dignity, what does it mean to respect human dignity? And I'm going to focus on two ways that are particularly important for me tonight, two ways of respecting human dignity. First, I'm going to argue, one respects others, other people's capacities for choice by observing a strong presumption against constraining other people's exercise of their capacities of choice. Okay, so um, I, I, I just, if you're not familiar with philosophy, this, this might seem a little curious, uh, let's use the word agency. Uh, agency just means our experience of choosers, as doers of things in the world. Um, and what I'm suggesting is that there is, in a sense, an equation, or at least a, a relation, um, between um, a certain way of treating another person's agency, their ability to choose. There's a relation between that on the one hand and an effect on dignity. And then we can use that notion of dignity to understand some very important <coughs> values, freedom, um, if you want, I, I guess you can think of this as my proposal for an ethical periodic table, right? You know, in chemistry they try to um, find some unity beneath all the chaos of the world's uh, substances. And what I'm trying to find is some unity uh, beneath the multiplicity of values that we experience and I'm focusing on freedom and quality here. Um, so the, I've said uh, one way of respecting dignity is by trying to avoid constraining a person's exercise of choice, right? Um, the clearest case of constraint, the clearest case of screwing up, right, and, and, and constraining a person's dignity uh, would lie in the physical uh, constraints of prison setting, right? Now, of course, there's going to be times when that's required, um, and I'll say more about that uh, later. Uh, but you need a very good reason to put someone in prison, uh, because um, putting someone in prison is very serious constraint on their exercise of responsible choice. And without that good reason, it counts as a failure to show due respect for human freedom. The second way um, that one respects other people's capacities for choice is by observing a strong presumption against ignoring the existence of those capacities. Okay, you don't want to ignore the fact that someone else capable of responsible choice. In other words, you want to recognize in others the existence of those others as beings capable of choice. And I believe this mode of respect 
is best understood as respect for other people's equal moral worth. And that's how we get equality. So I'm suggesting that just as the first mode of respect helps shed light on freedom, the second mode of respect for dignity helps us to understand the value of equality. But why? Uh, what is the connection between dignity on the one hand and equality on the other? Okay, well, my suggestion is that just as you have a life to lead through your choices, of course, other people have their own lives to lead. They're striving to lead their own lives through their own choices. So that you and other people have a status in common, a common status. You are all, you are both people with lives to live and shape through our own choices. Um, and I suggest it's this common status as beings capable of shaping our lives through our choices. It's this common status uh, that we have in mind when we speak of the moral equality of human beings. And that leads to the follow-up question. Well, how can you fail to recognize other people's status as beings with the distinctive human capacity for choice? And there's a lot of different ways, unfortunately, I suppose. Um, you could fail to uh, recognize another person's status as a being capable of choice if you treat them as something other than such a being. For instance, if you treated other people merely as means to your end, as mere instruments for your use. Um, this might happen most drastically as if, if you enslave someone, right? You're converting them to a tool uh, for your own purposes. And less drastically, um, if you lie or manipulate or cheat other people, then you're using them as just an instrument. You're degrading them, you're demoting them down from the status as another person with his or her own choices to just an instrument to manipulate for your own ends. Um, for those of you who study Kant, that should bring a, uh, a bell of familiarity. That was um, famously a formulation that Kant used in describing uh, the essence of wrongness. Uh, but that's just one way, treating people as instruments. Um, and there are other ways of failing to recognize people as, as equals. You might treat them as pieces of garbage to be destroyed. That's what happens in ethnic cleansing, for instance. Or you could treat them paternalistic, as children in disguise, people who are incompetent in making their own choices. Uh, or you might just be completely indifferent to another being's fate and treat that person as a, a non-entity. Right? You could treat other people in light of a stereotype, and in that case you're viewing others as people whose choices are fated to take a certain form. You're viewing those other people as cardboard cutouts, so to speak, of people, not as full-blooded ones. So there's lots of different ways of failing to recognize uh, another person's uh, status as uh, a being capable of choice, and I suggest in that case that failure of recognition amounts to an insult to that person's dignity. All right. Um, so it's important to understand dignity to have both of these in mind, freedom and equality. Freedom is not enough to really do justice to human dignity. Um, that's what I say here. And I'm going to go back to my example of Rosa Parks and her courageous act of refusing to give up a seat at the front of a bus uh, to a white person. And I want to suggest we can only understand what was wrong with the Jim Crow segregation by acknowledging the independent weight of equality as an important manifestation of human dignity. Um, the freedom that was involved in denying Rosa Parks the use of the first rows of the bus well, there was a denial of freedom there, right? She was not free to take a seat in the first few rows. But that doesn't really help us understand why we were so, or we are now, so uh, repulsed by the idea of denying African Americans a seat at the front of the bus. The freedom that was lost with that denial was actually quite small. Okay, imagine, for instance, uh, a law uh, being passed here in Utica. Um, it had to be a crazy law, but you know, like any city that's possible, I suppose, to pass crazy laws. Suppose they pass a law that denies everyone the right to sit on the first three rows of seats on a bus. Okay? 
So now you're, no one is free to sit on the, 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 the first three rows uh, of a boss. It would be an inconvenience, especially if the seats were crowded, right? Good thing to see and no one see. But the inconvenience is just that, an inconvenience. What Rosa Parks experienced was more than just an inconvenience, right? What really explains a revulsion was the denial of equality, the fact that blacks weren't allowed to sit in these seats and whites were. So we only really get at the heart of the injustice by understanding this as an insult to the dignity of African Americans, and that's what Rosa Parks stood up uh, against. Um, so I want to suggest or um, argue that um, to really respect dignity requires attaching value not just to freedom but to equality. And that's going to lead into my next topic, uh, and that's the main topic today, um, because uh, I want to talk about opportunity, and freedom and equality have implications for opportunity. Um, they're both linked, and we're going to need both to understand what a dignified being deserves by way of opportunity. Um, so obviously constraints. Constraints on opportunity are constraints on your ability to exercise choice, and so they limit freedom, right? So a, a lack of opportunity, a constraint on opportunity, will be a constraint on your freedom. And it's important to avoid those so much as possible. You need very good reason to tolerate those as a society committed to dignity. But more than, a, more than freedom, as I've insisted, there has to be a dimension of equality uh, that's valued as well. And if you have significantly less opportunity than your fellow citizens have, then the political, the social, the economic institutions you live under do not treat you as an equal. Instead, you're treated, I suggest, as a non-entity, someone whose well-being is of no concern. Um, you're treated as an instrument for others. Maybe others are glad that you have no choice uh, you have little opportunity apart from taking menial positions in society because then they don't have to take those jobs. Um, in that case, you would be an instrument for others. Uh, you would be there to serve the people who really matter. Um, and that would be inconsistent with uh, dignified existence. You might also be, and I'm going to use the phrase that's in the title of my talk, an internal exile in your own country, your capacities for choice. Where did I get that phrase, internal exile, from? Well, once again, I'm going to get some help from Martin Luther King, Jr. Um, and this is a passage from his famous I Have a Dream speech. It's delivered at the Lincoln Memorial, August 28, 1962. We're coming up to the 50th anniversary of it, just this, this summer. Um, and uh, one passage in it that really had an impression on me as, as a youth reading it is this. Um, he uses the old-fashioned language, um, and it's kind of drawing from modern names, but let me just read it. I'm not going to be able to mimic his words for it, which is uh, it's a hard act to follow, for sure. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. One hundred years later, the Negro still languishes in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. And it's that last passage that has given me my phrase, an internal exile. Uh, if you're an internal exile, if you're cut off from the mainstream, if you face constraints in your opportunity, uh, that uh, make you an island unto yourself, uh, then you're an internal exile. I hope this August 50th anniversary is an occasion for some self-examination of our society, asking ourselves how far we've come. We've come a ways, right? There's progress. We have an African-American president, for instance. Um, so there is good news to report, but we still fall short of the ideal of equal opportunity in many ways, and I'm going to talk about some of those ways and suggest some ways out and talk about how we understand equal opportunity. Okay, so let me turn to that. Let me turn to uh, different ways of understanding equality of opportunity. 
Um, one of the most preeminent philosophers, political philosophers of the 20th century, uh, was this man by the name of John Rawls, who wrote a very famous book called The Theory of Justice, set the agenda for political philosophy, um, but still with us. Um, and influentially, um, he defined two principles of justice, one of which, a part of which, contained an important uh, ideal of equality of opportunity. And Rawls distinguished between two conceptions of equality of opportunity. There's one easy one, excuse me, and one more demanding one. Uh, the easy one is the formal equality of opportunity I have up here. Um, and this ideal demands equal opportunity at the point of hire. And the ideal is uh, that hiring would be done only on relevant qualifications. And that's as opposed to signs like in the South, in the Jim Crow area, you know, whites only, uh, no blacks need to apply. That would be inconsistent with formal equality of opportunity. A refusal to hire women for uh, a job she's, uh, they are qualified for, that likewise would be a denial of formal equality of opportunity. Um, and by and large, this is a widely accepted ideal in our society, at least we pay lip service to it, right? Um, very few people would go on record saying, I think discrimination in the workplace is just fine. So we've made progress as a society in forming a consensus, at least at the level of aspiration, in favor of formal equality of opportunity. What this set suggests is the need for a level playing field, right? When you apply for jobs, you shouldn't force a, a face of playing field tilted against you in the form of racist criteria, sexist criteria, or hire. Okay, so the first um, conception, if we had to boil it down into a bumper sticker, would be a level playing field. Fair equality of opportunity is more demanding, more robust, an ideal of equality of opportunity. What it demands, and this is the one that Rawls thought was required by justice, is equal opportunity at the point of hire, yes, so it agrees that formal equality of opportunity is necessary, but it says more is needed for a society to claim truthfully it lives up to equality of opportunity. Well, what more is needed? Well, recall that formal equality says what matters is qualifications. It shouldn't matter you know, uh, in, in cases where race is irrelevant or sex is irrelevant, what, what your race or sex is. What fair equality of opportunity says is it's not just enough to hire on the basis of qualifications. What matters is whether there was fair opportunity to obtain those qualifications in the first place. You can imagine a case, and I'll give some evidence that unfortunately this is the reality in a lot of ways, uh, where one segment of society has very well-funded, very engaging schools with very well-trained teachers, and other segments of society have underfunded schools uh, with out-of-date textbooks, um, teachers who are a little more than babysitters. And you can imagine those extremes, and I'm going to suggest, unfortunately, um, not quite that extreme, but uh, some disparities still exist in our society. Well, the student at the poor school would not have anywhere near the same opportunity as the student at the well-funded school to obtain the qualifications needed for this first kind of equality of opportunity. And what Rawls argues is that in itself, that disparity at the level of training is likewise a denial of a valuable form of equality of opportunity. Again, if you had to boil it down to a bumper sticker, uh, what for fair equality of opportunity requires is not just a level playing field, but a level training field as well. There's going to be limits to how level we can make and even how level we ought to make it. Uh, but the point is, is that we can't just be indifferent to disparities in training opportunity if we want to say we value equality of opportunity. All right? Um, more precisely, um, what would it mean for fail, fair equality of opportunity perfectly to prevail? Well, Rawls says, if fair equality of opportunity perfectly prevailed, then two individuals with the same drive, the same willingness to make an effort, the same potential for talent, well, they would have the same prospects of success. 
So if you had a child born in the inner cities who had this potential to be a brilliant scientist, um, then with fair equality of opportunity, he would have just the same odds as someone born to a wealthy family with the identical potential to be a brilliant scientist. Um, that's what it would take for fair equality of opportunity to exist in the world. Well, we have to ask, does it exist, right? Does fair equality of opportunity prevail in the United States? I'm going to take off my philosopher's hat for a little bit, and I'm going to put on my amateur social scientist hat. Um, because to answer this, we need some data. We need to say, you know, can we measure whether fair equality of opportunity exists? So I'll warn you in advance, I love data. I'm going to give you lots of yummy data here in just a second. Um, because I want evidence. I don't want to just stand up here and spout ideology. I want to show you that there's reason to um, accept the conclusions I'm going to be supporting. Well, here's an interesting screenshot of a column by David Brooks in the New York Times. It was from a while ago, eight years or so ago. Um, David Brooks, if you read the New York Times, he's the like, token conservative, right? On the New York Times op-ed page. Um, and he wrote a uh, op-ed uh, piece that was very interesting to me um, because he was lamenting a decline in economic mobility in our country. There's been some very careful science, uh, social scientific research that has tried to measure economic mobility. And what they've done is they've kept surveys, they call them longitudinal surveys, and they look at families, fathers, sons, mothers, daughters, economic earnings over generations. And we have uh, lots of the data that goes back decades. And so what they're able to do is measure how much a son is earning relative to a father. They chose fathers and sons because it started way back in the 50s when um, the workplace was still largely you know, structured by gender. Um, and what you find is that um, in our country, um, more so than many other countries, it's actually harder to move up the ladder. Fewer people do it. Um, the ladder is a metaphor that suggests different you know, tiers of income earners. Um, and what Brooks, surprisingly as a conservative, was acknowledging here is that the ladder can be a little sticky in our country. Um, that if you're on the bottom, it's harder to move up to the top. If you're on the top, it's actually harder to fall down to the bottom. Um, and scientists have been able to measure this. Um, and there's been some interesting international comparisons. Uh, so let me go to those. I apologize for the fuzziness of, uh, of um, the line, the, the, the company names on the bottom. Um, what this is, is uh, a measurement of how much son's earnings have mirrored father's earnings. So the higher the number, the more likely a child's income is likely to mirror his father's. Okay, and like I said, they've used father and son here because they're looking at generations back, starting back in the 50s, when the assumption was it was the males who were the bread earners. Um, and so a high number means um, the average male, his earnings resemble to a higher degree his father's earnings. So what you find is the United States is near the top end. Um, these two um, slightly less orange bars are what the authors of this graph call the low mobility countries. So uh, the US and the United Kingdom are low mobility countries. Slightly better are France, Germany, and Sweden. Um, and then in the high mobility end, uh, Canada, Finland, Norway, and Denmark. So just to the north, a couple of hours. Um, I, you know, you're more likely to be able to move up the ladder if you're born at the lower end. Think of this as like a stickiness quotient, right? How sticky is that ladder? Um, and it's stickier here than in all of these other countries with the exception of the United Kingdom. Okay, bear with me for a little bit. Uh, a couple more charts. Um, in a way, I think this is more vivid a demonstration. So what they did is they, divide, they divided society into five income groups from top to bottom. Social scientists will call these quintiles. Um, 
okay, it's a one-fifth segment. And they looked at uh, men whose fathers were born in the bottom fifth of the earnings distributions. In other words, they looked at men whose fathers were born uh, at, uh, um, men, so men who were born in the bottom of the ladder. Their fathers were at the bottom of the ladder. And they asked how many remained on that bottom rung when they themselves became adults. So in Denmark, 25% of men born in the bottom rung stayed on the bottom rung. In the US, it was 42%. So a lot more stayed on the bottom rung in the US compared to Denmark, for instance. Um, what about the top fifth? Um, people who climbed all the way up the ladder. Well, in Denmark, 14% of people born at the bottom climbed all the way to the top 8%. Okay, so, again, the ladder is stickier here than in these reference countries. A few more. Um, I want to look at, I want to kind of unpack the data here. Um, because what you find is disparities in mobility depending on whether the Americans in question are white or black Americans. There's actually some good news here. I mean, the good news is, um, that you know, the majority of people um, get at least somewhat above their parents. So they're looking at um, the percent of adult children with family income at least $10,000 above their parents, adjusted for inflation, so that we're comparing apples and apples. The good news is, is of white Americans, 85% who were um, you know, raised in the bottom end up with even more money than their parents. Black Americans, two-thirds, more than two-thirds end up with more money, but still that's a significant difference between white and black. Black Americans are less likely to move up than white Americans, and that holds true for every quintile. The sad fact is, is there weren't enough African Americans in the surveys who were at the you know, uh, fourth and top uh, quintile. The quintile is you know, one of those five rungs. There weren't enough uh, African Americans in their survey at the uh, fourth and fifth rung or the top to be statistically significant. Now we can also ask the downside, right? Look at people who didn't move up the ladder, but moved down the ladder. And we want to see how many adult children uh, with family income, ended up with family incomes below their parents, at least $5,000 below. And you'll see here, tremendous disparity, almost you know, none of the white uh, uh, individuals ended up uh, $5,000 below where their parents started. Uh, at the, on the second rung, 6% of white Americans slipped down, but three times as many black Americans did. So uh, the, 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 the ladders aren't equally sticky for whites and blacks. Um, there's less economic mobility for blacks. Um, well, that's the general worry. That's general evidence that we can do better in terms of economic mobility than we're currently doing. Uh, and what we have to do now is ask about the causes of this. Right? Why? And what can we do to improve this? So what I'm going to do is suggest some attempts that would be worth trying to make things better. And then I'm going to deal with some objections then I go back to philosophy and deal with some objections to equality of opportunity. Okay, one point I want to make is schools matter. I mean, one fatalistic view of this is, well, different people have different genetic IQs, and, and that's why people at the bottom stay at the bottom, and that's why people at the top stay at the top. <laughs> Apart from being a racist view, it's also an unscientific view. Um, if you're interested in this issue, issue of IQ and schooling and opportunity, um, you could hardly do better than reading uh, this book by Richard Nisbet, who's a uh, University of Michigan cognitive scientist and expert on IQ. And you'll see from this book, it was published just three years ago, um, really a definitive book. Um, he argues that schools and cultures count. Okay? Genetic fatalism, the evidence isn't there. Um, and it's not just wishful thinking. Um, it's hard scientific evidence that he cites. I can just refer you to that book. Um, so, 
that's a clue as to why there is this gap in mobility. Um, we should look at the schools in part. Um, and what you find here, this is a graph on the y-axis, it looks at communities with poverty levels, okay? And so what this does is it takes, uh, it says look at communities, some size, more than a thousand in the community, um, in that school district. Uh, well, this is a community with 22.6% of its kids below the poverty line. And the average per student expenditure, this was a while ago, it's the most recent I could find, um, but the average um, per pupil expenditure is 4,000. On the other hand, when you get to the wealthier communities with just 6.4% living in poverty, what do you find? You find three times the per pupil expenditure. So, unfortunately, the students who need the best schooling, uh, the ones with the cards stacked against them, get you know, the least uh, well-funded uh, 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 school. Okay. Um, but even waiting till kindergarten may be too late. There's been some really fascinating social science research uh, where s researchers have gone into families and meticulously counted uh, the vocabulary uh, of children. Um, over the hours of interaction, um, and they've compiled the data. Um, and they contrasted children of professional families, children of working class families, children of welfare families. Um, and don't read that as just black children. Um, the majority of children uh, were white, actually. Um, the majority of white students uh, are white students. Um, and what they found is stunning differences in the language abilities of these children starting as young as 24 months. So by the time these students enter school as five-year-olds in the kindergarten, there's already a stark divide in their preparation. So that suggests you know, one way of trying to address the disparities in opportunity is by starting school even earlier than five. Um, and here, I want to give you an example of an economist who's done some really fascinating work. He's no slouch. He's won a Nobel Prize. Um, he's an economist with the University of Chicago. If you know anything about the University of Chicago Economics Department, it's like this bastion of conservatism. Okay, it's famous for its free market purely. Um, and he himself, he describes himself as a conservative economist. But he's one who can crunch numbers. And what he's done is cost-benefit analyses of preschool programs. Um, and what he's found is that preschool can make an important difference in opportunity for the kids exposed to very quality forms of preschool. That's why quality matters. Now, I'm going to actually quote from this article. It's an interview in the Washington Post. Heckman says as follows, quality really matters. That's been pretty well documented. I would argue Perry, uh, this is the Perry Preschool, which has been most thoroughly evaluated, is extensive. In terms of the return on investment per dollar return, the annual return for what you get on a bond or some kind of fixed income, you would have a rate that was 6 to 10 percent, which is extremely high. In other words, investing in preschool is a very good investment, so that even though it costs something, it's about the return. Uh, it's about the return is to, what the return is to society to the individuals. They are very good investments. Um, I'm going to go quickly over here, um, but basically what he did is he looked at the cost. Okay, um, for putting a child through several years of preschool, it's pretty expensive, fifteen thousand dollars. Right, of course that's tax money, and you think, oh my God, right? I'm going to go broke if they tax me to pay for this. But his point is it saves the taxpayer money in the long run, okay? Well, um, uh, because they you know, make less demand of like, special needs uh, education programs later on, um, they go on to earn more money, right? You can see up here, this is the percentage of kids in the program who earned more than 20,000 at age 40, percent more earned higher incomes, and that generates more taxes from the kids who are now higher earners, okay? Fewer go on welfare, right? So you save money there, but this is the big one. 
okay, crime savings, um, there were dramatically different uh, you know, conviction rates depending upon whether these kids uh, from disadvantaged backgrounds went to the school, the preschool or not, right? So yeah, you outlay, right, as a taxpayer, 15 grand to put a kid through preschool, but you end up saving 195,000 tax dollars over the course of that uh, student's adult life. That's a pretty good deal, right? Um, so this is a case where, you know, it's not just being asked to pay for other people, but investing in other people. And that's not a surprise if this opportunity that we're talking about, because the whole goal of fair equality of opportunity is to give people the opportunity to use their talents using and developing talents that benefits us all, okay? Um, I've talked about the rest here. Um, let me talk about something um, that's another way in which we fall short. What I've got here is I've got some statistics from the OECD, which is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. It's sort of a Rich country, it's a rich country's country club, so to speak. They keep statistics on um, uh, uh, you know, GDP, on literacy rates, crime rates, prison rates. And so one interesting point of comparison is how many people are in prison per 100,000 inhabitants. Um, and this is what um, we've got here as an average for these countries. It's about an average of 140 people per 100,000 in prison. And what they've got over here is Russia and the US. You see those little hash marks at the top, right? That means the graph didn't fit in the space, right? They didn't have room to put it up there. So they had to like draw a little like broken line and say, it really is high. Well, I want to make it true. Right, so we've got 760 people per um, 100,000 in prison. So let's just work out what that would be. So it's about 100 people per eight inches. I calculated it before, that works out to be 12 and a half people per inch. So how high would we have to make that? I've got my uh, calculator here. So it's 760 divided by 12.5. So we have about 60 inches, 60.8, it's called 61. So if we drew this to scale, I'll start it right here, and I'll go up 61 inches, and then we'll learn how many people are in prison in the US compared to, oh, let's see if I can even get there. Denmark, strangely enough, you're more likely to get broiler in Denmark. 
So it's one, one statistic we're not like in the hall of shame. Uh, that's good news, right? Um, okay, well, is there an alternative? Uh, I don't have a silver bullet here. Um, the pre-K program seems to me almost a silver bullet. There's almost no downside to that, and I was glad to see Obama in the State of the Union address um, insist on, on the importance of um, uh, uh, preschool, quality preschool. With um, prisons, it's harder. Um, it's, it's, it's a trickier, uh, more complicated problem. But there's some ray of hope. I'm not going to um, suggest this is the answer. It needs more study. Um, but there's alternative forms of justice that um, don't just resort at a first pass to throwing someone in jail. Um, they offer drug treatment, for instance, um, more community service, um, more follow-up with um, the people passing through the system, speedier uh, passing through the system. Um, and uh, this results in 50% um, fewer cases of incarceration for the students. I mean, some people we want to lock up, some people really are dangerous, right? Um, but uh, the experience of those other countries suggests that you need to lock as many people up as we do and still have a safe country. Um, and maybe this is one way to go. Um, well, somewhat less repeat offender, it's not like a huge, miraculous lowering of repeat offense. But what do we achieve with something like this? We achieve Slightly lower crime rates, slightly lower repeat offenses, drastically lower incarceration rates. We could bring that uh, bar graph down and have fewer broken families, more opportunity for the children there. Okay, and that's a, a uh, study that was done by our own state, which found that this alternative wasn't perfect, um, but it works well enough to expand. Okay, I'm almost done here, and then I'll break for some questions. Um, what about objections to fair aquatic opportunity? In philosophy, we like to look at all sides and be fair to both sides of the debate, and I want to talk about uh, some objections. So I'm going to um, um, look at two from the right here. And one objection says, it's a pipe dream. It's not real. It's impossible to achieve. Um, families are always going to shower their kids with as much advantage as they can. Um, some families are going to provide enriching environments for their children, take them to museums, fill their house with books. Others are going to be more neglectful parents, and that will never change. Um, and the only way, really, then, this criticism goes, to have equality of opportunity is to abolish the private family, communally raise children, um, that would be tyrannical. And I agree, that would be tyrannical, right? And they're probably right that to have perfect quality of opportunity, we would have to get rid of the private family, and that would be disastrous and horrible. And I'm certainly not calling that for that no defender of quality of opportunity. I know it is calling for that. But this is a case where we don't want to let, quote unquote, perfection be the enemy of the good. Right? Just because we can't perfectly achieve equality of opportunity doesn't warrant us giving up trying in any degree. What we should try is to achieve as much fair equality of opportunity as we can, consistent with recognizing a reasonable sphere of family and family time. That's a tricky balancing act. There's no magic formula. There's no ultra precise algorithm for how to balance these two against each other. But what we know, I think, from the data I've provided, especially in comparison with other countries, is we can do better. So the possibility of perfect equality of opportunity doesn't excuse us from trying. OK. I want to put this in provocative terms, because this is how it often gets phrased, especially in talk radio um, and um, um, other forum like forms. That. Why should we take the money of hardworking people and give it to the least? That's an objection you hear. Um, often it's not phrased as provocatively as that, um, but probably in the back of the speaker's mind is something like that. Um, one important distinction to make is between equality of opportunity on the one hand and quality of uh, outcome on the other. Um, what equality of opportunity is 
striving for um, is just that opportunity. Uh, it's not a handout saying, hey, here, take this, you don't have to work. This is an opportunity to acquire the qualifications to have a flourishing work life, right? So it's about opening the doors to work, not shutting down incentives to work. Okay. The distinction is a little fuzzy. Um, if I have time, I'm not sure I will, but if I have time, I'll talk a little bit more about that distinction. Um, but even if it's a fuzzy distinction, it's still a distinction uh, that holds at the extremes, and this objection ignores it completely. Okay? Also, like I said with the preschool example, it's not um, just a handout in the sense of pure sacrifice from the taxpayer uh, and pure benefit from the receiver. It's an investment, right? Um, the cultivation of talents that it makes possible benefits us all. Okay. Um, two more replies to this. Freedom is an important value, and that's what this um, whoa, uh, that's what this is suggesting, right? It's saying, hey, um, why should someone be less free to keep his own money or her own money and be forced taxation to give it to the undeserving? That's what it's saying. Why should we uh, uh, put constraints on the freedom of people to use their money as they see fit? And freedom is an important value, uh, but it's not the only value. And in fact, I think we only really understand freedom. Uh, by understanding its connection with dignity. But once we understand dignity, we understand that dignity is also connected with equality. Um, neither value takes absolute priority over the other. It's a balancing act. It's not an easy one. Uh, but the fact that it's not easy doesn't excuse us from pretending there's no balancing and always choosing one value over the other. Both are important. Here's the final reply. Our institutions define the rules of property. The economy is a very complex institution. Okay? Um, the currency is printed by the government, controlled by the government. Um, uh, corporations exist because of corporation law that defines different kinds of com uh, companies, S corporations, limited liability corporations. Um, there's quite a legal variety. Um, the, um, uh, the government provides public education to educate the workers. Um, so the economy uh, is uh, created by we, the people, I say here. We're defining the rules of property. Okay? Now, suppose people define rules of property so that there's just a bare minimum of taxation, an absolute minimum, uh, that can fund maybe the police and the fire department and the court system, but nothing else. No public schools, and some people would have uh, certainly no prepaid for instance. We could do that, right? We, the people, could define property and, uh, uh, so that there's a minimum of taxation. But if we did that, then we, the people, would be leaving segments of us with unfair levels of opportunity. And a reply to this objection is that we, the people, should not construct our institutions in a way that, whoops. That shouldn't be there. It leaves part of us as external exiles. Basically, what I'm suggesting is that someone who's asking this question is asking, why should I care whether the rules of society are tilted in my favor? Why should I want to stop the rules of society being tilted in my favor? Um, and I suggest that just to pose that question, But um, the difficulty of it shouldn't dissuade us from trying. Uh, it's imperative that we reform our society and try and make it worthy of the courage of those pioneers of dignity like Rosa Parks, like Tank Man, like Martin Luther King Jr. That's something we should all aspire to. Thank you.
uh, nature of capitalism lends itself to the um, preservation and furthering of human dignity. Because I see a lot of corporations that don't seem to have any regard for human dignity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's a big question. Um, a very big question. Um, I would answer it by saying, in a typical philosopher fashion, it depends. Um, and by it depends, I mean it depends on what kind of capitalism we're talking about because there are different types of capitalism. Um, if we're talking about what I'm going to say, say fair capitalism, which is a minimal state, minimal amounts of regulation, then I would agree that that just seems to give the green light uh, to individuals to amass you know, private power and use it to extract what they want from others. Um, on the other hand, um, there are different forms of patronism. Think back to that comparative chart I had, which listed other countries like Denmark, Canada, um, Sweden. Um, those have thriving capitalist segments as well, all right? Um, they're what you would call mixed economies, where there's a, uh, there's a larger public sector uh, um, element than we have here. Uh, but there is still a thriving uh, capitalist section. Like, uh, Nokia, I think, is Swedish or Finnish? Uh, Finnish. Finnish, okay, right. Um, so you can have capitalism, um, but do better than we do here. Um, so I don't think it's all or nothing capitalism or socialism. Um, I think that dichotomy is over, um, over stressed that it ignores, it's kind of a false economy, it ignores um, um, intermediate ranges. I think one solution uh, would be uh, to revitalize workers' movements here. Um, one difference between those countries that I didn't need time to stress uh, on that spectrum of opportunity um, is how many of their citizens are in the union, and the U.S.'s union membership is in the where many other countries have been holding steady. And I think it's important to have that channel to um, you know, the business interests. Unions are not perfect. They're an interest group. And they can be as self-interested as you know, managing the self-interested. Um, but it's better to have you know, a self-interested group to balance out the other self-interested group rather than just have you know, one organized source of power. So um, I would hope that we could stay within the capitalist system, but um, give workers more say either support through a revitalized union movement. Or there's other opportunities. I mean, even in Europe, for instance, um, some countries don't have as much uh, unions as we traditionally think of them, but have workers' councils that have some of the rights of unions, but not all. And those seem to do a good job, too. Um, we could have a tax code that encouraged worker-owned enterprises. Um, that would still compete on the market um, in a capitalist system, um, but uh, would be structured differently so that more of the returns came to workers. Um, so I, I'm not ready to give up on capitalism yet. Um, I'd like to explore ways of putting human face on capitalism. And I think we have a lot to learn from the outside world. Once you have fair quality of opportunity, 
uh, then you shouldn't go on just taxing at will, right? But um, to um, tax um, you know, some citizens to, or to uh, have levels of taxation uh, to fund equitable schools um, is certainly within the legitimate uh, aims and powers of government. Why? Well, because um, as a society, uh, we have to have a form of institutions, we have to have a form of economy, a form of government, a form of the school system that pays due respect to everyone's dignity. Um, and if we say we're going to have an absolute minimum scheme of taxation, so you're on your own for schooling, if your parents are neglectful and they don't put you in school too bad, um, well, that is just to turn our back on a segment of society that we left behind as internal exiles. Go back to what you started out by saying, and also another big question, or my big question, about paternity. Mm -hmm. You said that basically dignity is about fully informed, deep choices. Deep mm -hmm. choices, and in order to be able to make those choices, you have to have an intellectual framework. Mm -hmm. which you do. Not everybody wants to go through the hard work of acquiring that framework. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, we make our students take core courses because we think it's good for them, and they'll be able to make more informed course mm -hmm. choices once they've done that. And I hear the popularity of that in suggestion. But the, the, where does the role of paternalism come in in saying to people, you need to go through this in order to become a person who's capable of deep choices? Well, first of all, I don't oppose all forms of paternalism. Paternalism is an appropriate attitude to take towards you know, the non adults, the children in our society. And so schools inevitably are paternalistic. Um, what, um, so, so, of course, education is going to have to have some ideals it's espousing, some curriculum that it says, you know, as students, as children, you have to do this because it's good for you. Um, the hope would be that um, the curriculum that's designed doesn't reflect just a narrow, narrow sectarian slice of society, um, but that the skills it, could, it teaches are skills that can be appreciated as valuable by um, a number of groups in society. Um, so, um, you know, I, I would um, I, I would want you know uh, there to be a curriculum that um, was able to tell students here is what you'll get out of this, um, and be able to quote skills that are of broad use so that. Their, their values can be appreciated by uh, people, whether they're Christian, Jew, Muslim, uh, whether they're um, you know, uh, aiming at being an artist or a, a, a type of industry, um, so that um, the, the, uh, the justification of it, even though it's paternalistic because it's being forced on children who aren't yet you know, adults, the justification can be uh, addressing the reason of parents as well, uh, it doesn't reflect just the sectarian uh, conception of what is good value. There are going to be limits to that, right? Um, because uh, and there's going to be challenges here, and, and uh, I don't have an empty formula. Um, what if we teach science, right? Which we should, of course. That's going to put um, the schools at odds with fundamentalists who are threatened by creationism, for instance. Um, so there's going to have to come a certain point when to stand up for you know, the truth of the claims that schools are teaching. But it's, it's, a, it's a difficult issue. That's probably not as clear an answer as you would have liked. Joshua? Um, my question is kind of about internalism, too, actually. I, I'm, I'm curious as to should we assume that all adults, or all people, mm -hmm. are capable of deciding what's their best interest? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, and I, the answer is probably not. Right? Um, and, uh, I just want to use one of your examples. Okay, okay, go ahead. When you talk about um, the destruction of the private family would be tyrannical and be horrible. Um, I'm curious as to one, why, why do you think that is? And two, it seems to me that if there are, there are plenty of, of bad parents out there, um, people who, who probably don't raise their children in what would be considered being a correct or good way, um, would it not then be better for those children? If we did 
raise them communally or by society or however you want to put it. Um, I, I don't understand why that's considered a bad thing. And it's also kind of, I think, assuming too much with those parents' comments and their own and their children's best interests. OK, yeah, a lot there. Let me actually take your more general question first, uh, which was, are adults really, all adults really capable of this? Um, and the answer is, unfortunately not. There are going to be some adults who are very, you know, mentally challenging. Uh, who are going to just, by the nature of their um, predicament, have to remain as dependents, right? Um, uh, and so um, that has to be frankly acknowledged and treated as an important case that I haven't treated here. Um, but for the general run of people, um, I, uh, the, the uh, morality like law is going to have to work at a general level. Um, take a legal case, uh, the right to vote. Uh, we're allowed to vote at age I know a lot of 14-year-olds who I think would be better voters than a lot of 30-year-olds I know, too. Um, but how would we implement that as a society? You would have to, I suppose, rent a competency voting board, have interviews, and be certified as competent. And I suggest that that would open the door to all sorts of abuses. Uh, it would open the door to all sorts of unintentional insults. And, uh, as well as being cost and condition. So it's just the nature of law that it has to exist at a general level to some degree. And I suggest the same is true of moral rules, like laws have to be couched at a general level to be workable. Otherwise, we have a Byzantine you know, moral code that no one could apply or understand. Uh, and so um, it, 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 it's um, best to work with general principles and the best general principle is one of presuming equality, except in the special cases of people so uh, mentally uh, um, challenged that they're going to forever remain in this. Um, so that's, that, that's how um, we still respect equality while admitting the spectrum of credibility of choices. I understand what you're saying with the idea that, that the setting of, like, let's say, a board or something would, you know, would lead to a lot of possible problems. But the problem with leaving it the way it is is we end up with George W. Bush as president for years. So I think that, that you need to have you know some kind of middle ground. Which we I don't think that's inevitable, though. Um, I think part of the problem is our uh, campaign finance system, which sure. gives uh, tremendous power to the wealthy. That's a whole other lecture. <laughs> I won't go into that uh, today, but just to say uh, again, we could do international comparisons, and there seems to be. Um, international experience that suggests it's possible to have a presumption of equality not exactly with obviously qualified uh, leaders. Um, so and the solution there uh, would be addressing the imbalances of wealth and particular the influence of wealth and, and so on. Rather than giving up equality, I would want to try those first. Um, the private family, I mean why would I say it would be uh, terrible to abolish it? Um, well I, it's just uh, an assumption about um, flourishing of children. Uh, I make that um, they require uh, individualized, special loving attention. That um, uh, it would be hard to replicate that on uh, 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 a communal level. Um, sure, um, it might work better uh, for some children of neglectful parents. Um, but what you would have is uh, uniform mediocrity instead of um, uh, you know the potential for uh, excellent nurturing environments, and, and um, I, I think that would be unacceptably leveling down, right? Um, and this is a tension with inequality of opportunity. Um, a level playing field could be achieved by leveling down, but I don't want to go as far yeah. down as that. Uh, I'm not suggesting you to destroy forever when I'm saying that in certain cases, mm -hmm. I mean, would that be possible that those children are better off? I, I, I'm not suggesting you take I just, and again, I, I, you would have to have some board to determine the competency of parents, and that, I think, would be so fraught with the potential for disrespect and insult um, that the gains in dignity for those children whom it works well for would be offset by the tremendous disrespect uh, that you know, being called before a criminal judgment board would entail. Um, I, I, I don't want to dismiss your concern. I, I see you know, that it might actually improve the lives of some people.
people, but the costs in terms of uh, dignity would be higher. <coughs> Maybe kind of couple of these together now. Um, I understand the argument with children we have this sort of responsibility towards some type of paternalism. Mm -hmm. But there's also this sort of we have to live and let live mm -hmm. at some level, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess one of the things in objection to there is isn't there an inherent paternalism in this idea of I'm going to tell you how much money the government needs to have in order to ensure that well, who's aren't, the, we, aren't we now treating those responsible taxpayers essentially paternalistically as though they're children of the skies? Is there, is there justification for the paternalism there? I mean, if it was a case of a dictatorship telling uh, the citizens, or I guess it would be subjects in a dictatorship, um, this is the level of taxation that uh, you will be required to up, uh, then there would be a case for the journalism, uh, of excess journalism. On the other hand, we're nominally at least a democracy. We could be better. Campaign finance reform uh, would make our democracy more truly representative. Uh, but if you can achieve the truly representative democracy, um, then uh, the level of taxation is a judgment of we the people applying to we the people. It's horizontal. And that uh, uh, blunts the part of the Sure, but I mean, if you're going to make that argument, then in the political system as it stands, if you're going to turn on one hand and blame special interest group for the abuses, what you're advocating is a special interest group to do this instead, which... How is it advocated against special interest group? Because when we're admitting we don't have the democracy, you know, so I mean, if the proposal is to table this conversation until we completely fix democracy, that seems like a separate issue, but also an impossible one. So is it worth, are we saying, well, my special interest group is better than your special interest group and should push this through an admittedly flawed democracy? Well, I guess the question is whether we want to give up on the pursuit of fairness because our democracy is flawed, um, or we want to try to, at the same time, pursue fairness alongside improvement of democracy. We just say, well, our democracy is flawed, so any legal judgment of fairness would be a judgment of one segment of the population against another, um, then that just means that we're not going to pursue fairness, and we're forever locking ourselves into both an unrepresented democracy and an unfair society. Um, so the only solution is to press forward simultaneously, despite the objections. Jim? Professor Carroll? You know, I think to some extent there's a sort of red herring in some of the objections, I think, in that every political system takes money from people. Every political system taxes, then limits the freedom that it takes economic material resources from people and redistributes it to other people. Um, some of the most redistribution in our current society is redistribution to oil, oil companies and other special interest groups, what's often called corporate welfare. Um, and the issue is, in every society, we have to make decisions about how do we distribute the largest, the, the, the marginal productivity of society that can be taxed and utilized for social purposes. And it seems to me fundamental that it's ironic that it's always the people who advocate for the less powerful in society who need to explain and justify the redistribution of resources to them, whereas the oil companies, pharmaceutical companies and others have received massive subsidies from the government and uh, wealthy corporations that are given tax breaks for taking American jobs overseas are somehow held harmless in, this, in that discussion. I also think another element here is the difference between a long-term and a short-term review. I, as a taxpayer, may not, you know, we have this issue with property taxes, you know, when we had the little thing about education. In New York State, as many of you know, there was a, a, a a critical court case where it was shown in New York State that the money for education is distributed unequally. That was a court ruling that who fixed it. Still has not been enacted. And the reason, you know, people complain about the property taxes, well, I'm 60, I don't have any kids, why should I pay for schools? Well, you do have kids somewhere, and the society you don't live in is going to be a lot better if everybody else has a greater opportunity. And so, so much of this discussion seems to be to be focused on 
a lack of an ability, as you showed very well there, to look at the long-term benefits of a redistribution that is aimed primarily at empowering the disempowered, not further empowering the already empowered. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting social scientific research um, to suggest that um, past a certain point, inequality becomes a drag on productivity growth, GDP growth, um, so that um, actually um, some of the countries who've recently been faring better than the U.S. in terms of GDP increases have been more equal societies. Um, the uh, more, you know, past a certain point, uh, inequality becomes um, a, a, a drag that it slows down uh, growth. And so, in the long run, uh, less inequality is for everyone's uh, benefit. Um, there's a, if you're curious, a book called The Spirit Level that argues uh, this in great detail. Um, I guess I'm going to be with you there. Um, I, I just want to stick up for, um, it's kind of ironic because I'm going to decide, some libertarian philosophers. I, uh, like uh, uh, Professor Ripple said, I wrote a book, a debate book, where I took the anti libertarian side and my co author took the libertarian side. And I kind of went into it thinking, oh, you guys are corporate stooges, you libertarians. Uh, you're just there to uh, kiss the ass of corporations. Um, and I soon learned that uh, at least my libertarian co-author was pretty consistent and was absolutely adamantly diehard opposed to the corporate welfare you described. Um, and um, even was opposed to bankruptcy law that let like, you know, um, bankrupt businesses off the hook as far as their debts go. Um, so he wasn't this libertarian, and I soon learned other libertarians, just a down-the-line defender of you know, corporations. Um, so it is possible, I think, uh, to be uh, uh, a defender of the minimum state and impose corporate welfare, too. Um, so just a, a point in favor of my libertarian uh, opponents there. Um, but in general, I think uh, you're right that um, it's underappreciated how many benefits to the society as a whole can come from allowing people to <coughs> develop their talents. I mean, how many brilliant scientists, uh, brilliant musicians, uh, brilliant entrepreneurs uh, never went anywhere um, because um, their um, you know, parents were in prison or their schools were um, insufficient or um, they uh, grew up in a uh, uh, impoverished uh, house of the toddler and started school way behind their parents. We don't know, right? I'm sure uh, there would be many uh, entrepreneurs, scientists, uh, famous surgeons, um, uh, many more, uh, but we just don't know because not everyone's talents are being developed. I think I'll ask a question before I go to people who will ask several questions. I don't think I'm denying everybody's opportunity. Uh, I want to focus on something that I think you omitted to talk about, but that your notion of dignity might be able to okay. stand for. And it's based off a pretty simple observation that I think we're getting better with providing a level playing field for women, for example. I think we're, or a level training field, we have more women enter higher education. I think we're getting better at providing a level playing field. But there's something else that's off, and that's the fact that, for example, not only are there less women CEOs, but when there are, they tend to make a lot less money. Mm -hmm. So using the notion of fairness that we talked about, the fair quality of opportunity, I think we can talk about your training field by talking about background fairness. Mm -hmm. And we can continue to use the sports analogy, like talking about boxing, right? Mm -hmm. Talk about people needing adequate opportunity to train, mm -hmm. or for there to be weight classes. Mm -hmm. We can talk about procedural fairness. And this is what you seem to talk about. We could be playing by the same rules, but what we haven't talked about is stakes fairness. When we talk about equality of opportunity, we're talking about the opportunity people have to make a go at something. And I don't think we're equalizing the opportunity that people have to make a go at something if the stakes aren't the same, based on arbitrary lines, right? So women have, of course, arguably, and it's getting better, equal opportunity to be trained and equal opportunity to compete, but they don't have an equal opportunity Benefit from. Right. Right. I think your notion of dignity can right. get that. Yeah, so you want, in a way, for any person at a given level of talent, you want a given unit of effort to result in the same benefit. Um, and I 
and um, uh, that can be out of whack uh, in more than one way. Uh, and um, it's not just a matter of getting the job, it's the level of reward that Bruce gives and the one that's the job. Was that a front to somebody's dignity then? Yeah, I, I think it, it I mean, um, yeah. Uh, I mean, if there really is no difference between the job that a woman is doing and a man is doing, and yet the woman is paid less, um, then absolutely that's um, an unequal valuation, right? Um, which is judgment of unequal worth, right? Now, we want to distinguish um, between that unequal worth of workers, maybe the person um, values the uh, female employee um, you know, as, a, uh, as, as a person, but just not as a worker. So Distinguishing funds to a person people work as a worker versus people who work as a person. Um, and there would be some distinctions from there, but in general, I think there would not be any funds that would be. Could I, I just, I mean, the, um, the issue of uh, sports, um, I think I, the one, one thing I ran short of um, uh, in my uh, uh, slides here I didn't get to, and I, I, I'm really happy with these slides, so I'm kind of uh, uh, sad I didn't get to them. And they're only like, Two slides. So if you indulge me, just just like two minutes, um, and let me um, show you this because um, it's come up uh, in questions about um, uh, you know the tilt of wealth, um, and uh, we know uh, uh, that wealth is very unequal in this country. And the point I was going to make is that can influence opportunity as well, so that uh, children of wealthy families. Uh, have more opportunities to take unpaid internships for them. Um, they have more opportunities to borrow money from them, their parents for a startup, an entrepreneurial idea. They can take steeper risks from a wealthy background uh, in business, knowing that if they fail, um, there's a safety net in the form of their family wealth. So unequal wealth has an impact on opportunity. Um, the top 1% in this country own 35.6% uh, of the wealth. Now maybe that's because they're so talented, right? And so hardworking uh, that, um, you know, um, they've made a massively larger contribution to the economy and that's where their rewards come from. Um, and, and, and if you think that, you would think, well, that's the fair reward. It seems too lost to me and I'm trying to make this vivid to myself by thinking, well, what would a similar sort of reward look like if it happened in the Olympics, for instance? London 2012. Uh, we just went through last summer the Olympics. Here's the actual medal table. The US, USA. right? I uh, got 104 medals in total, so we won. Um, China, 88. Britain, third place, 65. Okay. Um, Suppose a country that had 1% of the world's population had won 35.6% of the medals. What would that look like? Well, I went through a list of countries and I decided to pick the country that was closest to 1% of the world's population. It turns out it was Turkey. Turkey has 70 million people, which is 1% of the world's population. What if they had won 36% of the medals, there were 2,300 medals total. The medal table would have looked like this. Turkey would have won 819 medals, right? Now suppose that had happened. Maybe Turkey is just an amazingly athletic population. Maybe if something like this really happened, I would think we would start to think, something fishy is going on here. There's been a tilt, a rigging, and this is a favor. Right. One more slide. We actually know that the top 400 wealthiest families in the U.S. claim 3% of the national wealth. 400 families is 0.0002% of the U.S. population. Okay. If we wanted to look at that in Olympic terms and imagine a country that small, you can't really do it. Countries don't tend to be that small. It turns out that a country one-fifth the size of Monaco would have won 69 medals. Or, more dramatically, a country one-ninth the size of Utica would have won 69 medals. If that had happened, would we say, oh, it's perfectly fair, there was no rating of the system in favor of the Utica? 
good neighborhood, they just are really athletic there. I don't think so, right? And I'm suggesting that that ought to make us suspicious that there isn't exactly the level of playing in the field. Okay. All Sorry. Right. I think what we should do, uh, if I don't receive any violent objections from the two repeat question askers, is provided it's okay with you, mm -hmm. they can ask questions after the fact. Mm -hmm. we'll circumstances do we respect and promote freedom by obscuring choice? What circumstances do we respect and promote freedom by obscuring choice or denying choice? Yeah, I, um, I would think very few. I'm wondering where you're going with this question, though, <laughs> since there's a part of I mean, with children, I think um, uh, there can be because uh, by forcing the kid to eat vegetables or um, go to sleep at a reasonable hour, uh, you keep them healthy and you can uh, um, uh, uh, lead them on a path where they end up more confident and choice at the end. So, in cases of just about journalism, um, I would think that that would be. Example, but as I said, I'm very wary once people are the adults of taking from the I'm curious what your one example is. Part of what it's not intuitive to have a lot of representation, but prison, house arrest, um, electronic ankle bracelets. I, mean, I, I think by denying choice, mm -hmm. we are respecting freedom in terms of. Of sanctioning individual behavior, mm -hmm. or whether there are other circumstances. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I see a way that that's respectful to you because it's acknowledging that you're a rational being, and part of being a rational being is looking at the consequences of your choice, and the consequences are that you're a dangerous society. Uh, then, in a way, we respect your free choice to choose a dangerous path. 